on the subject of how we got our Bible, leading up to the King James Bible. But in doing that, we, we've stopped, first of all, or started, first of all, by looking at the word Bible, because we're talking about a Bible, and what do we mean by a Bible? Well, the Bible don't speak about a Bible, but it does refer to itself as a book, or books, plural. And, uh, and so we call it the books of the Bible, and, and so we were looking in the scriptures concerning that and saw that it was indeed God's intent uh, to write a book so that his truth would be preserved through the generations. And uh, if we never studied anything else, that would have been enough to quit our study because if, that, if we can prove that it was God's intent to write a book that would be preserved for generations for people to know his truth, then it would have happened. You, you don't have to wonder if it happened. I mean, if, that, if it's God's intent, who's, how is God ever going to fail? So that was enough just to prove that. But that, that's where we started. But after that, we then started looking at the word Scripture. And, and actually, there's like eight different words that we're defining as, as I'm trying to introduce all this. But we looked at Scripture because the book that God wrote, that's what he calls it, Scripture. And uh, Scripture being the written Word of God. And, uh, and so we, we're looking at the very fact that that book is called Scripture. But then we had to stop and say, well, wait a minute, how do we know that we have all the Scripture? That is, the complete canon of Scripture. And so we study what the word canon is. That's not really a biblical term, but it does mean uh, the rule of our faith and practice. And, and by the canon of Scripture, what we're referring to is the fact that the 39 books that make up the Old Testament, the 27 books that make up the New Testament, that they're actually the complete and final authority. That it's everything that God intended to give us, nothing left out and nothing added in. And so we were looking at the evidence of that within the scriptures and primarily the, the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning that matter, concerning the Old Testament, concerning the New Testament. And so now we've kind of covered those terms and we we'll really kind of need to go all the way back to the beginning because the next words that I want us to look at is, is revelation. And then inspiration, we talked about scripture, but we didn't talk about inspiration. And then once you have the Bible revealed and inspired and written down in scripture form, then for us to study it, there is illumination that's required. And, and, then, and then the last thing then would to go on into preservation, which will then work our way uh, through the, the historical time and and show us why it is that we believe that the King James Bible would be that book that God preserved for English-speaking people. So I want to start with just, just some basic truths, but it, again, it's just like when we're talking about the book and when we're talking about Scripture, that as we look at these verses, it gives you a, the proper value for the book. Because I'll tell you, it, it's really a strange thing. There is, among Christians, and it's really been a slow, slow process, that there is not the proper value for the Bible in the sense that th there was a battle years ago when liberalism was creeping in. And, you know, when you go to the early 1900s up to about, you know, the 50s, there was really a, a real battle is, is, is the liberal churches and the liberal, like the Bible contains the Word of God, but it's not actually the Word of God and no one really believes it's the Word of God. And then, then the fundamentalists come up and, and you know, took took over the battle and said, no, no, we believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of the scriptures. And they're fighting for that, and they did a good job until you get into uh, the later 60s, maybe 70s, and, and uh, then all of a sudden it's the fundamentals who are saying, well, we don't believe that the, the English Bible is inspired of God. Of course there's mistakes in our Bible because God couldn't preserve his word in, in the translations without error. All we have is a translation. And then, and, and next thing you know, they're talking like the liberals used to talk. And, uh, and, and all of a sudden you wake up to the fact that, wait a minute, did God preserve his word or not? Because all the, everybody emphasizes now that the word of God is uh, verbally inspired and is a plenary authority in the original manuscripts. And all you got to do is read any book about the, about the Bible and find out there is no original manuscripts. There's zero. So if it's only verbally inspired and, and of plenary authority in the original, then it don't exist. 
So now then starts a, a, another battle, a pendulum thing, to, to get back to the understanding that, look, if it was God's intent to give us a book, he gave it to us. And then as we were studying about canon, one of the things that tongues, the whole study of the gift of tongues is all about, is God can speak in all the languages of the world. And that when God has completed his word, tongues were ceased because God quit speaking. But love motivated man to continue to take God's completed word now and translate it. And that's what's been the emphasis of missions for years, is to translate the Bible into the languages of other people so they could have the word of God and know what God has to say. So anyhow, I, I don't know how we got all to that, but I guess I was trying to stress the importance of your attitude. <laughs> the, I don't think, it, it's, it's, it's extremely weak to say that you believe God's word is a complete uh, verbal plenary authority in the original manuscripts. You might as well say, I don't believe the, we have the Bible today. You know, just say it that way because that's really what you're expressing. And, uh, and so by looking at these terms, I want you to have the conviction that God intended to give us a book. He gave us a book. It, the book is complete and the book has been revealed and, and written down in Scripture, uh, insp inspired in, in the Scriptures, and, uh, and then... Uh, it illuminates us and has been preserved for us through the ages. Deuteronomy 29. I probably never told you the chapter, did I? I did? Oh, good. I never got there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just kind of introducing. There's a, it, it's like there's a lot of, we've looked at a lot of verses about the Bible. Some of these will be a repeat, but not all of them are a repeat. We're looking at it by looking at these different words, looking at it from different angles. And so right now what we want to do is study the revelation. And, and by revelation, what we mean is that which is unknown and unknowable, but has been revealed to us by God to certain men chosen by God. And, uh, and when we talk about revelation, we're not just talking about, you know, I got a revelation, I got a thought. You know, people do that even with the word inspiration. But what we mean is, uh, I mean, if you got God and the Bible tells us in Isaiah, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. As the heavens are above the earth, so my thoughts are above your thoughts. Well, then how would you ever know anything of God unless God reveals what is unknowable to you? And, and certainly you couldn't know God. I mean, he's invisible, and, uh, and, and he's in the third heavens, and so you would have no way of having any understanding about God except that God would reveal himself, and he's revealed himself in his word. So there's revelation. In Deuteronomy 29, verse 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But... But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the things, uh, all the work, words of this law. And we're particularly in the passage, it's a re reference to the nation of Israel and the things that they don't know. Well, they can't worry about those things, but God has revealed some things to them. And the things he's revealed is for them to know and for them, in this, in this point, it's to, to keep the words of the law. But the, the whole point is, is what revelation is. It's something that's unknown and unknowable except that God would reveal it. And God began to reveal things through Moses to the nation of Israel. I look at that verse, and when it says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, what comes to your mind? The mystery. The, mystery, the age of grace. It's almost like, you know, they're just simply saying that the things God hasn't revealed, it's still a secret. But there comes a time where God reveals some of that secret to us. And when I say some, all that he wants to reveal to us has been revealed because to Paul is given the revelation of the mystery. But that, that's later as we go through these list of verses. Come over to 1 Samuel. And I, I love this. This is the call of Samuel. If you know Samuel was called as a child, actually it was... Um, given by his mother to the priest as she promised God that she would give her son to him if he gave her a son. And so Samuel is being raised by Eli the priest and God begins to speak to Samuel because this is going to be the time of the prophets that God's going to begin with Samuel. And so he's calling Samuel and in verse 7, it's, 
Oh, oh, chapter 3, 1 Samuel 3. It says, Now Samuel did not know the Lord, neither the word of the Lord, uh, neither was the, the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel and said the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for uh, thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Now, we didn't start at the beginning. He, three times the Lord starts speaking to Samuel, and he keeps going to Levi, Eli and asking Eli, what do you want? And Eli says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. <laughs> so now Eli realizes God's talking to Samuel. It says in verse 9, Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and laid uh, down in his place, and the Lord came and stood and called as other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of every of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. And so he's going to reveal something that they're not even going to like to hear, but it's going to be about judgment and stuff that's going to come. But God begins to speak through Samuel and reveal things he didn't know, the things of God, didn't know God, because the Word of God hadn't been revealed to him, and now God is going to call Samuel. And, and I've referred to you before that you realize historically this is an important time in Israel's history, when in Acts 3, Peter says, From Samuel and all that spoke afterwards have likewise foretold of these days. So when we talk about how the kingdom is going to come in through judgment and then through the Lord's second coming or the Lord's coming, uh, all that begins with Samuel and afterwards. And uh, before that is the law, and then now this is the time of the prophets. But now these prophets, like Samuel, not only did God reveal stuff to him, he becomes a writing prophet. Here, here's a verse in Isaiah, just for you to, chapter 22. It matches what we're just learning here. And if you've ever heard Pastor Jordan preach, he, he, I don't know how often he refers to this verse. Because the people who always talk about, you know, like as if they're getting revelation from God today, when they say that, they'll, they often will try to say, you know, well, but he didn't speak audibly to me. And Pastor Jordan, he just says it over and over again, so it's ground in my head, all the programs I edit, is that the reason they say, well, it wasn't audible, is because they don't want someone to come in a, in a, in a truck with a white coat, tie him up, and put him in a cell somewhere. Because, <laughs> you know, when people start hearing voices, there's something wrong. And people do hear voices. And uh, it caused from all kinds of different things, you know, schizophrenia and chemical imbalances and all the rest. So the preachers, they don't want to look like an idiot or anything, so they'll talk about God revealed something to them, and they'll say, it wasn't in my ear. Well, was it in Samuel's ear? Yeah, God talked. He used words to talk to Samuel, and they were audible words. Isaiah says a similar thing here in uh, chapter 22 in verse, where did I mark that? 14. It says, And it was revealed in my ears by the Lord of hosts. Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die, saith the Lord of hosts. And it's speaking about the nation of Israel. And it, it, but when Isaiah said, revealed to me in my ears by the Lord of hosts. So the Lord, when he was revealing himself, he was revealing with words and audibly speaking. Now maybe some other people couldn't hear the voice, but they could hear the voice of God. And, uh, and, and so God was revealing himself to them. You know, last week, and uh, Donna's not here to hear this, but I, I was thinking about, when I was talking about those who are still saying they're getting revelation from God, that that is a cult. I, I don't take back that statement. I know it offended Donna. But, but there's two things there. I was saying that so you realize how dangerous it is for people to add to God's Word. But the other thing is, is I, I, when I say a cult, I wasn't saying they weren't, not everybody who says that is a lost person, and she was getting that impression, but maybe she didn't even just like me calling someone a cult. But stop and think about that, because what, 
in Donna's choice of debate there, and what she was doing is defending the Christians that she might love who are still participating in this. She came to their defense. But she, what she failed to realize is I was trying to come to God's defense. I was defending the scripture. Because that is an offense to the scripture. That's an attack on the scripture. That's an attack on God's word, is it not? Amen. And I, I, I didn't think about it until later Sunday afternoon. Because I understand Donna's feeling about that. And I understand that when I say things, sometimes it offends someone. And, and yet I, I, didn't, I didn't even ever want to back down from the statement. Because I made the statement on purpose. But I didn't realize what the difference was in uh, her way of thinking and my way of thinking. Where she's defending ignorant brethren to continue to do the things that they're doing. And I'm defending God's word, calling that to an end and making sure you're not carried away by winds of doctrine like that. So there's two ways of looking at things. And, you know, when Paul says, I, I think Lou might have even said it right after Sunday school. It might have been why I started thinking about that. Paul wasn't ashamed when he started talking about the gospel. And, and he says, if anyone preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. Now, I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. He, he just went out right after it. And, and, you know, you attack the gospel. Well, do you defend the gospel? Or do you defend the ignorance of people who use a false gospel message and spread that message out to lost people and get them to think they're saved? No, you better defend the gospel for the sake of the lost people who are getting taught wrong. So we're saying these things in defense of the scriptures. And, and God did reveal. Uh, another from the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 1. Now this is where Daniel starts receiving revelation. I... You know, I said one, but I bet you it's two that I want. Yeah, it's chapter two. And this is, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. No one can interpret the dream because he, he wouldn't tell, he wouldn't tell the, what the dream was. So all his magicians and soothsayers and astrologers, uh, they... they they could make up an interpretation if they just knew what the dream was. But the king won't tell them what the dream was. He said, tell me what my dream is, was, and then tell me the interpretation. Well, when no one could do it, he was going to have everyone killed. Daniel starts praying, and then God revealed it to Daniel. And, uh, and so in verse 19, this, we look at this to understand revelation, what revelation is. Verse 19 says, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. So he starts naming these declarations of the glory of God because God has revealed some things to him. The things that were a secret are revealed by God. And, and then Daniel, just speaking about the glory of God, begins to enumerate how many things here seven different statements for the wisdom uh, for the wisdom and might are his verse 21 and he changeth times and seasons number 3 he removeth kings and setteth up kings four he giveth wisdom unto the wise five knowledge to them that know understanding six he revealeth the deep secret things Seven, he knoweth what is in the darkness, and what dwelleth, uh, and, and the light dwelleth with him. So Daniel, God had revealed that to him, and then Daniel, I always like that where he goes to the king and makes clear to the king, verse 27, Daniel said uh, in the presence of the king, uh, and Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king? But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known unto king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter times. Thy dream and the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. And then Daniel reveals them to him. So, revelation, God reveals. Now, all of that, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2.
1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul talks about the mystery that was revealed to him. Verse 7 says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So there's the prophetic things that were revealed back there. Now here's that secret that God still kept until he revealed it to the Apostle Paul. So Paul speaks the, 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 the wisdom of God in a mystery, wisdom that was hidden, Verse 8 says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It centers around the wisdom of God in the cross, and the wisdom of God in the cross has to do with the, God's purpose in grace, that the cross becomes a whole means by which God can open up a whole dispensation of grace, form the body of Christ, and seat us in the heavenly places. So, that was never revealed, otherwise, if Satan would have had any idea of these things, he would have never crucified the Lord of glory. So, God didn't reveal it. It was a secret, the opposite of revealing. But verse 9 says, it says, but, but as it is written, I have not seen, neither ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. You know, it never even entered in the heart of man what God was planning to do or what even the thought of what God could do. Uh, it, it was such a secret that unless God revealed it, it would have never, never dawned on man at all that what, God is going, what God has done for us and prepared for us that love him. But, verse 10, God hath revealed them. And then verse 11 says, For what man knoweth the things of man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man. But we have, not, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we may know the things which are freely given to us uh, of God. So we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit more on, under illumination, but the very fact here that God has revealed those things. And then you go through Paul's epistles. And Paul said, I certify you that the gospel I preach, I didn't get it from man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. And then, you know, Ephesians chapter 3, he makes the declaration, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which has given me your word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Revelation revealing to man things that were unknown and unknowable, but God reveals them. And uh, go to Revelation chapter 1. You don't hardly need this, but there's something that I didn't say last time that I wanted to say, and I'll throw it in now. Consider, consider these statements. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to show unto a servant the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto a servant John, who bore record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus and all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So, the revelation that John receives is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. It was given to him by God, as God sends an angel to reveal those things to John, and, and it, it's going to be a revelation concerning Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus Christ coming to set up his kingdom. I say that because in Hebrews chapter 1, when it says, in these last days God has spoken to us by His Son, when we were talking about the completing of the canon of Scripture and that the New Testament, that God was speaking, and then with the completion of the New Testament, God quit speaking, that we have a complete canon of Scripture, that the New Testament, that from the very beginning when the Lord started talking about the Spirit coming, and when He comes, He's, going to, he's not going to testify Himself, He's going to testify of me, for He's going to hear of me. When Paul writes in, Rome, in 1 Corinthians 14, if we would have kept on studying the, the tongues passage or the spiritual gifts passage, Paul concludes by saying, If any man spiritual or prophet, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So that when the apostles wrote, even the Holy Spirit brings things back to their remembrance, what they're writing down were the words of Jesus Christ. He, the Spirit is going to hear from Jesus Christ and deliver it to them. When Paul gets the revelation of the mystery, he keeps saying he got it from Jesus Christ. So Paul's epistles are Jesus Christ's words to you and me. 
when you come to the Hebrew epistles, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, Hebrews through Revelation are the words of Jesus Christ. Come to Revelation 22. Um, John falls down at the feet of the angel, just overwhelmed with things. Verse 9 says, And he saith unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and thy, uh, and thy brethren, uh, and of thy brethren the prophets, and them which keep the, the sayings of the book, worship God. And he said unto me, uh, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is just, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Um, well, I'm almost there. Uh, actually, down in verse 16 is where I... Yeah, just go right to 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root, the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to those things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in the book. If any man take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and the holy city and the things which are written uh, in this book. The, the, the whole point, uh, um, is that the words are the words of Jesus Christ. That's by verse 16. I've sent, I, Jesus, have sent my angel. Back in chapter 21 when he says that, uh, uh, he tells John to write these things. I'm Alpha and Omega. And, and anyhow, that that the sayings of these book are true, and he gives to everyone of the water of life freely. The point is, is that when you get to the conclusion of the book of Revelation, it's clearly Jesus Christ telling John to write it because it's true, and it's his words, and then with that warning, don't add to or take from at the end. And so the point of it is, is that obviously, and you already knew this, but obviously all the New Testament are the words of Jesus Christ. You know, those the Bibles have the words of Jesus in red, and I know like they're historically trying to give his narrative in, in that, but it's, it really takes away from the fact that everything you read in the New Testament are the words of Jesus Christ, and it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so uh, that, I just say that on top of the canon of, the, of, the, of, of Scripture and the very fact that revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, come with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. Because after God has revealed, the way that the, it gets in the book that God intended to write is the book is called Scripture, but how God's Word gets down into Scripture is through the process that's called inspiration. You, you, you know that it says uh, uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. When it says all Scripture is given by inspiration, the Lord said... Uh, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When we talk about, script, about inspiration now, what we're talking about is the words that God would have us to know. That God used men, and it's a, it's a real interesting, miraculous um, way that God gave us His word. Uh, one of the... Uh, one of the things that you do when you study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you realize you've got four views of the Lord Jesus Christ as a king, as a servant, as a man, and as God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And, and so there's different ways you can go through Matthew and realize how he starts out talking about Jesus Christ as of David, and so you realize the kingship. You, st you go through Mark, and everything is the movement of Jesus Christ, and, and you realize he's showing a servant. When you get to Luke, he keeps calling him the son of man, and he starts with a virgin birth, and he goes all the way back to uh, Adam in his, in his genealogy, showing Jesus Christ the man. And you come to the book of John, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Now, God used Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and breathed out of the mouth of God came the words that God would have us to know. But he used men to write it down. And, and it's not just the men that were inspired of God. The words they wrote down were inspired of God. But what God did is use those men in their personality and in their training to write the very words that he wanted there. Now, that, that's, that's fascinating because I say that because if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then you look at who each one was. Matthew was a, a government worker collecting taxes for the Roman government. God used him to write about the kingship of Jesus Christ. Mark was a young man, and a young person serves, and he write, uses him to write about Jesus Christ as, as a servant. Luke was a doctor, and God has him to write about Jesus Christ as a human, as a man. And John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one who leans on his breast, the one who's more theological than all the other disciples, especially when you read the book of John compared to the other writings, God uses him to write about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he uses man and their personality to get the words that came out of his mouth down on the page. And that's what inspiration is. We're not going to look at 1 Peter, so uh, we'll look at it next time. But, but inspiration is a, is a, is a marvelous way that God gave us his Bible where there's personality involved in it of the writers and yet what they wrote is the very word that God would have us to know and, and so God used these men to give us his words. We'll talk about that next time. Our God and our Father, we pray that looking at all these different things that we'll have a real strong appreciation for this book. That you, it's, it's, it's your living presence on this earth because it's a living word and uh, Father, it can live in us as well, and we'll get to that as well. So we pray that we might appreciate it for what it is, your very word, and uh, never speak negatively about it at all. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Donna said she was going to write you or call.